All right. Hello and welcome to another Facebook author interview here at BookTrib, the leading source for book news and reviews. My name is Cameron Kimball. I'm an editor here at BookTrib, and today I am so delighted to be joined by Carlo Treviso, the author of the electrifying historical thriller, Siciliana. Carlo, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I'm so excited to talk about this book. Um, and I think the best place to start would be, what is it actually about? Just so viewers can know. For sure. So I wrote a novel called Siciliana. And Siciliana takes place in the year 1282 AD in Sicily. And at that time, the French occupied the island of Sicily. And you may, you may or may not know, but Sicily has been conquered by every civilization in the Mediterranean from the Greeks to the Romans, the Arabs to the Normans. And by 1282, that was the French. The French came in and took over. And they were very abusive, a lot of cases of rape and molestation, um, a lot of atrocities committed against the Sicilian people. And what happened was on March 30th, 1282 AD, on Vespers night, so Vespers is the night of the Easter vigil, the Sicilian people came together to celebrate in the city of Palermo. And what happened was the French kind of came in and crashed the party. They started, you know, stealing from the men. They started molesting the women. And what happened was um, a Sicilian woman allegedly took out her stiletto blade, which is essentially a, a short sword that they had at that time. She took out her stiletto blade, stabbed a French soldier and cried, Moranu li Francischi, which means death to the French or Angevins, as they called them back then. And after she did that, all of the other Sicilians were like, yeah, death to the French. They all took out their blades. And then what, pre what proceeded was a very intense uprising in the city of Palermo where the Sicilian people essentially slaughtered, uh, you know, up to 2,000 French soldiers, including other men and women who spoke French. It was a complete massacre. And for about two weeks, the Sicilians actually took back the island until the Spanish came in and then conquered them again. <laughs> so that's the time frame that that's that kind of um, event is what Siciliana centers around. That is mm -hmm. intense. And that's that sounds like a fantastic inspiration for a story. So what specifically really uh, drove you to write this book? I mean, there's a lot of fodder there, obviously. For for sure. So my, my initial inspiration for writing the novel was um, I'm so I'm the first generation son of a Sicilian immigrant family. Uh, my, my dad came here from Sicily when he was a young man. And, and growing up, when I would mention my Sicilian heritage, anyone unfamiliar with its past, the typical response usually included some use of that notorious M word, like, oh, like the mafia, hey, godfather, stuff like that. And I always felt that my Sicilian heritage deserved better than, than that kind of depiction that we see in popular entertainment, novels, books, media. And I decided that the only way to confront these negative perceptions was just to change the narrative altogether. So I decided to write a novel about Sicily that had nothing to do with the mafia, that was more about what I loved about Sicily, which was kind of like this knight lore. So Sicily, you know, had tons of knights back in the day. Like not a lot of people know this, but it was its own kingdom. It had knights and kings and all of this cool stuff. And I wanted to tell a story about that. That was like, that's where the exquisite stuff comes from, in my opinion. And I like to say in the book, um, a land of forbidden knights, forgotten fortresses and fallen kings. Wow, that is... That is epic. Um, and what a great inspiration. I know my family, we're not Sicilian, but my family's from uh, the same town that the characters from The Sopranos are. So I can definitely relate. And that's really inspirational to want to like change the, um, the public perception for the better and really be inspired by what you truly love. That's so cool. What town was that, by the way? I'm just curious. Avellino, it's, um, it's actually by Pompeii. So it's, uh, okay. it's up there in Naples. Gotcha. Great. Yeah. Well, I should also add, this is a funny story. So after I launched the book, I actually, I launched Siciliana on March 30th, the 740th anniversary of the Sicilian Vespers. Oh, operation. wow. That's perfect. So, yeah. And when I launched the book, um, so my mom, uh, wonder, she told one of her coworkers about it, like, hey, my son wrote this novel. And her coworker is a, 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 this old Sicilian woman, of course. And um, her coworker asked, oh, is it about the mafia? And I was like, there you go. Like, that's the perfect example. Even a, an old Sicilian woman 
who hears the no a novel about Sicily immediately, her mind immediately goes to the mafia. Right. So I, that just that just gave me the extra val validation that I was on the right path with something here. Exactly. Yeah, it's such an untapped part of the history that really deserves to shine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I also wanted to ask, you have this incredible main character, Etna Vespiri. Um, what led you to developing her as a character? Is she inspired by like real life people or is she like purely fictional? Great question. So yes. So um, for the viewers who don't know, Etna Vespiri is the main character of the book. She's a she's a Sicilian woman who's the daughter of a, of a Sicilian knight. And she's the one that eventually sparks this Sicilian Vespers uprising against the French. Um, and then you follow her journey as she as she steps into this role of revolutionary leader and becomes the Siciliana. So the, the characters in the book, um, it's very interesting. Half are real and half are fictional. So first of all, the way to tell is most of the French characters are actually real because there's a lot of good historical record about them. So for example, the Viker of Sicily, his name is Herbert Orleone. He's kind of like the main villain. He's real, he's a real guy. He had a, a justiciar that worked in Palermo, uh, Jean de San Rami, and that was a real guy. He's kind of the guy that ran Palermo. Um, so I did incorporate a lot of like the like the French villains per se. They're actually real people. Um, unfortunately, the Sicilians, not a lot of record there. So that gave me a lot of artistic liberty to come up with my own kind of new and exciting characters. And Etna Vespiri is one of them. So like I mentioned, um, Etna is the woman placed right directly at the center of the Sicilian Vespers event. And she becomes the, the hero Siciliana. She, there's a lot of other side characters that are helping her along this journey, which are also fictional. But again, with, with writing novels, I mean, that's the fun of this, right? You can take artistic liberties with a lot of things, a lot of the history. Um, the Sicilian Vespers, there is not a lot of record about it. So I did take a lot of liberties with the way that things unfolded because, you know, that's that's the fun of what we do. And sometimes you have to. Absolutely. Well, they, they always say that history is written by the victors, so it unfortunately makes sense that the occupying French would have so many records, but I guess it was, it did in a way give you the opportunity to play with the Sicilian characters and really add your inspiration and imagination into the story. Absolutely, yes. And I, if I can add, um, my, so I have two younger sisters. I grew up with sisters. I have, I have a lot of women in my family. I'm, I'm pretty much like one of the only guys in my entire family and um, uh, extended family, that is. And I, so, uh, you know, like I have this really big respect for like the strong female lead. And I, I when I wrote Etna, I incorporated a lot of my sister's personality into her character, kind of like her wittiness, her sassiness, her strength. So Etna does become kind of like a tribute to my own family. That's amazing. That's That's awesome. I'm sure your sisters were very pleased to hear that because um, she really is a great character. Um, she's so strong. I was so impressed and learning that about, specifically about the history of fighting with the stiletto and how she was training with that. I had no idea um, where that word came from or how it has such an interesting history. And so it was so great to see this female character just kicking butt. <laughs> totally. And I'm actually glad you brought that up. So I just I just want to add um, like you mentioned, the stiletto blade. Um, I incorporated a, a lot of elements into the story. Um, terms, pieces of language that came from Sicilian that we use today that are completely taken out of context. So for example, um, the stiletto, you know, like, you know, if you heard that today, you would think it's a high heel. Oh, it's what women wear on a night out. Exactly. Right? But, like, but back in that day, it was, a, it was a sword, essentially. And that's what they used to fight. Um, another term I used is, is this, there's this term called omerta. It's a, it's a, it's a Sicilian term. It, it's basically what happened was there's this term called omerta. And um, it means a code of silence. We're not going to talk to the authorities. Like, you know, we got each other's back. We're not going to talk to the authorities. We're going to honor Omerta, a code of silence. That was a medieval term that the mafia then appropriated and turned it into kind of like, if you speak about us, we'll kill you. You know, so there's actually, a, I, I believe there's a book called Omerta about, you know, the mafia and all that kind of stuff. But um, what I did was I took a lot of the pieces of the language and I, I gave you the true context to where, they, where it came from. So if you ever were to read, you know, modern books about Sicily or the Sicilian Mafia, you'd start to see, oh, that's where this term came from. Oh, that's, you know, it's like you start to get the actual history and versus what's been appropriated over time. That is awesome. Yeah, it's like finding Easter eggs of our modern language. That is so perfect. Cool. Perfect. 
perfect term. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I consider them. <laughs> oh my gosh. So another thing that I think um, was a bit of an Easter egg in terms of not knowing the history behind something and then revealing it. You have the first thing that you notice about this book is it's very intriguing cover. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on that. What exactly is the symbolism behind this incredible image? For sure. Yes. Yeah, so that's one of the biggest comments I hear a lot. You have this really like intriguing cover that's like a, this like horrifying picture of Medusa. What's that all about? And basically what the cover is, is a modern, uh, I guess you could say interpretation of the current Sicilian flag. So if you go on Google and you Google the flag of Sicily, what you'll see is this image of Medusa with the three legs and these um, three buds around it. And, what, and um, as part of Siciliana, I wanted to essentially give the audience a taste for how this flag could have came into existence. Because again, there's not a lot of historical record about who designed this flag or where it really came from. So I used the opportunity in the book to have Etna Vespiri essentially design a Sicilian flag as she's kind of going through her journey. Because at that time, Sicily was, you know, it was kind of tribal. People were kind of spread out by villages. There wasn't a sense of real unification. And she decided right. on her journey, you know what? Sicily needs an identity. And I'm going to create a flag for us, basically, that we can wave when we head, head out and face the French in battle. Um, and in the story, you, you, get the little, you get the pieces of how this flag was created. So you start with Medusa, where that comes from, where the three legs come from, where the, where the artichoke buds come from. And as the story progresses, she adds each of those to the flag. That is amazing. Now, yes. just, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, she's like the Betsy Ross of ancient Sicily. She <laughs> is. Like, or Betsy Ross, or I like to say Batman. <laughs> oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> like how, how Batman was kind of known for taking stuff from his own life and creating the legend around that. Like his fear of bats became the symbol of Batman, you know, stuff like that. But Betsy Ross is a great example. Strong female that develops the exactly. planet. Exactly. But also the, the martial arts of Batman. I would say. Exactly, exactly, right. But with with Medusa, so if I can just provide this piece of context. Um, so Medusa, as you know, is an ancient Greek symbol. And um, the original story goes that she was a beautiful Sicilian woman. So a lot of people don't know this, but Medusa was considered a beautiful Sicilian woman. She lived in Sicily. And she was taking a walk one day along the shore. And Poseidon, the god of the sea, saw her, thought she was so beautiful, and said, I must have her. And he accosted her. Um, now, Medusa was eventually rescued by Athena, who's the god of the goddess of wisdom. But this is where the story gets funny. As a punishment to Poseidon, which is, is weird, she turned Medusa into a demon, <laughs> which kind of gives you a, like, yeah. you know, that's the, the patriarchy back then, you know? So she turned Medusa into a demon, but that was an act to actually protect her. She gave her this power to turn men into stone. She became a demon, and that would protect her from all of these, you know, men who were trying to come after her. Right. And what happened was that she eventually became a symbol of protection against evil. So if you go to Sicily, you'll see a lot of imagery of Medusa on vases and cloths and whatnot. And that's because she's considered a, a, a symbol to ward off evil, basically. Oh, wow. That is and so... I, I had no idea. Yeah. And I speak to that in the book. So Etna wears a medallion of Medusa. That right. She has her father. And then she that that goes on to the flag um, with, with the three legs. That's essentially so there are two meanings to that. The first meaning is it, it represents the three points of the island of Sicily. So Sicily is an island. Essentially, that's like a triangle. Three points. Right, yes. But the other more kind of dramatic meaning that I found behind it is that no matter where you throw a Sicilian, they'll always land on their feet. So they're constantly spinning through history, getting thrown around, tossed around. But you know what? They'll always keep landing on their feet. The entire way. And finally, um, the, the artichoke buds. So this is a very controversial element to the, the cover because um, the Sicilian flag, it's it's the original Sicilian flag. A lot of people say it's uh, those, those buds are wheat ears. Some people say they're corn ears. And I've gotten a lot of feedback and, and questions about like, why did you include artichokes in your story on the Sicilian flag? I thought those were wheat ears. Well, there's actually a very specific historical connotation for that. So if I can, if I can just tell you this quick story. So in, in Sicily, there's this term called Cosca. And I allude to this in the novel. And Cosca essentially means artichoke. It's Sicilian for thistle, but essentially it means artichoke. 
And as you know, artichokes have kind of layered blades around them, you know, protecting the fruit. And um, in Sicily at that time, they also had these things called stiletto blades, like we mentioned. And it was with the blade of the stiletto that you protected your family. So what happened was the Sicilians would come together with their stiletto blades and they, they created this kind of cosca of the family. So cosca eventually became associated with the word family. And on our story, Etna, I mean, the family is a huge theme in this book. And Etna essentially, you know, takes that artichoke theme of Cosca and family, and that's why she works it into the flag. And if you actually look at an image of the Sicilian flag, it looks a lot more like a thistle or an artichoke than it does a wheat of, a, an ear of wheat, which is kind of longer and more feathery. Right, yeah. No, that is so interesting. All of that symbolism packed into one flag. That's one little cool. flag, exactly. Oh my gosh. So you clearly know a ton about Sicilian history and have done extensive research. I also noticed that you um, talk a lot about conservation efforts in your bio specifically. How does that tie into the book? Yes. So I'm a, uh, my, my first passion after writing or my first passion, but before I'm an author, I consider myself a conservationist. I have a huge passion for conserving, you know, historical history, culture, environment. And I wanted to incorporate that mission into the book as kind of like a secondary mission. And um, I'm a big supporter of organizations like UNESCO and the World Wildlife Fund. So if, if for those who don't know, UNESCO is a program run by the UN where they essentially protect heritage sites around the world. Uh, they're called protected heritage sites. And they're like ancient sites that are um, protected against, you know, like ideally war and destruction and vandalism and stuff like that. And in Sicily, there are about seven of them. Seven of them. For example, in the city of Palermo, the uh, Palermo Cathedral is a Norman-built cathedral that's protected by UNESCO. And I set a lot of my um, a lot of the scenes in the book are set against these real locations, so you can actually go there. You can walk around where the characters walk. You can see where the battles were fought. I wanted to do that because I wanted people to be able to read the book. And then actually go to Sicily and experience these places for real. And you can say, oh, this is the cathedral where Etna held her rally. Or this is the, the, the slope on Mount Etna Volcano where they fought the French. You know, so like I, I wanted to incorporate that to give people a really a sense of appreciation for these places really exist. You can visit them today and in a, in a sense, conserve them for right. you know, years to come. Um, right. And then, and then on the on the environment side, so um, the World Wildlife Fund has a program in Sicily where they protect native species there. And I one of them is the eagle, the um, Bonelli's eagle is what it's called. And I, I decided to incorporate that that eagle symbolism into the story also. So, so you get a sense that eagles were native here and that there's, you know, a, there's an effort to conserve them as well. So um, yeah, those are like, those are different ways I incorporated conservation elements into the story. No, that's that's incredible. And I really like the how you're able to simultaneously talk about these heritage sites and also give your readers a guide to like immerse themselves even more into the story, because it really does make it feel so real to know that these places truly do exist and were part of history. Absolutely. And um, you know, a hint as to what locations are actually real. I, are, I included illustrations in the book yeah. that show you a quick snapshot of like, you know, like this is the cathedral. This is the Greek theater. Um, so you, those are kind of like the first signifiers that I can actually go here. No, that's, yeah. that's so cool. I loved the illustrations. They were a great touch. Um, so quickly, we have time for our last two questions. Um, okay. What advice would you give other people interested in writing their own novel? Sure. Well, I'd like to answer this in two ways if I can. So uh, the first thing I would say is really study the, the, the craft of storytelling. And, and what do I mean by that? That's, that sounds kind of generic. So if you look out at the highway, you'll see many kinds of vehicles. You'll see cars, trucks, SUVs. And, um, but if, and they all have completely different functions. They're going in different places. But if you pop the hood on any of these vehicles, you'll kind of see like more or less the same components. Uh, you'll, you'll see a semblance of an engine, an exhaust, four wheels. And stories work the same way. And what I'd recommend is um, really studying um, like the masters, like a Joseph Campbell's hero journey archetype. 
which, um, you know, many modern movies and stories are set upon this hero's journey archetype, Harry Potter, Star Wars. So really study the elements of, or the parts per se of stories to really get an idea of how it should be, how it can be created per se. Um, the other thing is, you know, given the impossibility of pleasing everybody, right. um, you know, certainly I've had a few folks who weren't, you know, thrilled. Uh, most people, you know, you're always great to see when people love your work, but you'll always have a few that are just kind of like, oh, it wasn't for me. Given that impossibility of pleasing everybody, um, what you really need to do is kind of let your own taste guide you. What would you want to see out there on the shelf, in the movies, whatever piece of art you're creating, what would you want to see? And trust your own taste. You know, before you start sending it out for feedback and, and changes and all that kind of stuff, let, let your own taste guide you and, and see where that takes you for a while. Right. That, no, that's great advice because they really do say that you are your own first reader. You're the one reading the book before anyone else. So you're you're the one that in the end you really have to love your book. So you better you better write it the way you want to see it. Now, you know, to build on that, like it will get to a point where you will want feedback because by all means, like I mean, I was very happy with my first draft, but once it got to an editor and it got back to me, like wow, was it completely plussed up? Like she was catching right. so many things that I can clarify or build on or maybe omit because something wasn't really working. Um, so she totally plussed up the document, you know, a thousand times, wh whatever that is. But um, so, but you don't want to really do that right away. You want to stay in your own voice. I would say at least through the first complete first draft. And then after that is when you're ready for feedback and you can start tweaking it and get people's opinions. That is great to know. That's great advice. Um, and our last question, I think, is what do you wish for readers themselves to take away from the novel? Yes, well, I kind of touched on this earlier, but I, I hope that when people read Siciliana, <clears throat> they'll they'll get a stronger appreciation for, I guess, Sicilian history, Sicilian culture, where the people come from. The fact that Sicily is kind of an amalg amalgamation of many different cultures, and it, it's very different than what you would think of traditional Italian. Right. Like I mentioned, you get a little Greek, a little Roman, Arab, you get the French influence now because they were there. Spanish were there for a long time. So it's it's kind of like it, Sicily was the original melting pot, they say, of the Mediterranean. And it's very different when you go there compared to if you go to Venice or Rome or anything like that. Right. So I guess, you know, and it's Sicily is so much more than the mafia. It's so much more than, you know. Sopranos or Godfather and all this kind of stuff that you see on TV or, or film. And it really deserves that credence and credit. So I just hope people, you know, when they come when they come away from reading Siciliana, they'll think, wow, I really need to go here. Wow, this I had no idea this was part of Sicilian history. And I'm totally looking at Sicily in a whole new light moving forward. Right. No, that's that's an incredible motivation behind the story. And it absolutely really calls to people to go hit up those UNESCO World Heritage Sites and more about the country and really appreciate the story. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So thank you, Carlo, so much for joining us today. I learned so much about this great book. Um, I want to thank you for writing it. I want to thank you for uh, putting all your um, pride of your heritage and the just the history of Sicily into this book. And I believe you um, are also the leader of the imprint as well, the Treviso Originale books. Correct. That's my imprint. Yep. Um, you'll notice Treviso was spelled with an X. That's the actually yes. that's the Venetian spelling of, of my name. So my okay. name actually comes from the Venice area. There's a city called Treviso right outside of Venice. So I think event, at some point my ancestors must have traveled down Italy from Treviso and settled in Sicily because you, wow. you typically take the name of the city you came from. So I, I haven't done the research, but I, I have a suspicion that my family came from the Venice area and at some point in history came down to Sicily and settled there. So I, I, I pay a tribute to that in my in my imprint. That is incredible. That's such, oh my gosh, there's so much history packed into this, <laughs> this Facebook Live. I've learned so much. It keeps going and going, like, like the blades of an artichoke, just keep peeling them away. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Um, I, I know that readers and watchers of this will definitely be inspired to pick up Siciliana. It's an amazing historical thriller. So thank you so much for joining us today to talk thank about you. it. My pleasure. All right.